Hi, welcome back to Reads with Ring B. This is what I'm calling this, my reading with you. Um, it's also the official name for my YouTube channel. So please feel free to check the video out there. Um, right, let's get to it. School for Good and Evil, Chapter 2. The Art of Kidnapping. By the time the sun extinguished, the children were long locked away. Through bedroom shutters, they peeked at torch-armed fathers, sisters, grandmothers, lined around the dark forest, daring the schoolmaster to cross their ring of fire. But while shivering children tightened their window screws, Sophie prepared to undo hers. She wanted this kidnapping to be as convenient as possible. Barricaded in her room, she laid out hairpins, tweezers, nail files, and went to work. The first kidnappings happened 200 years before. Some years it was two boys taken, some, t some years two girls, sometimes one of each. The ages were just as fickle. One could be 16, the other 14, or both just turned 12. But if at first the choices seemed random, the Soon the pattern became clear. One was always beautiful and good. The child every parent wanted as their own. The other was homely and odd, an outcast from birth. An opposing pair, plucked from youth and spirited away. Naturally, the villages blamed bears, for no one had ever seen a bear in Gabaldon. But this made them more determined to find one. Four years later, when two more children vanished, the villagers admitted they should have been more specific and declared black bears had been the culprits. Bears so black they blended with the night. But when the children continued to disappear every four years, the village, soon, the village shifted their attentions to burrowing bears, and then phantom bears, then bears in disguise, until it became clear it wasn't bears at all. But while, villager, while frantic villagers spawned new theories, the sinkhole theory, the flying cannibal theory, the children of Gabadon began to notice something suspicious. As they studied the dozens of missing posters tacked up in the square, the faces of these lost boys and girls looked oddly familiar. That's when they opened up their storybooks and found the kidnapped children. Excuse me for a minute. Jack, taken a hundred years before, hadn't aged a bit. Here he was, painted with the same moppy hair, pinked dimples, and crooked smile that had made him so popular with the girls of Gavadon. Now only he had only now had he, he had a beanstalk in his back garden and a weakness for magic beans. Meanwhile, Angus, the pointy eared, freckled hooligan, who had vanished with Jack the same year, had transformed into a pointy eared, freckled giant at the top of Jack's beanstalk. The two boys found their way into a fairy tale, but the children present but when children presented the storybook theory, the adults responded as adult as adults most often do. They patted the children's heads and returned to the sinkholes and cannibals. But then the children showed them more familiar faces. Taken fifty year fifty years before, sweet Anya now sat on moonlit rocks in a painting of the Little Mermaid, while cruel Ursta had become the devious sea witch. Philip, the priest's upright son, had grown into the cunning little tailor, while pompous Gulda spooked children as the witch of the woods. Scores of children, kidnapped in pairs, had found new lives in a storybook world. One is good, one is evil. The books came from Mr. Duvall's storybook shop, a musty nook between Battersby Bakery and the Pickled Pig Pub. What a name, huh? The problem, of course, was where old Mr. Duvall 
got his storybook. Once a year, on a morning he could not predict, he would arrive at his shop and find a box of books waiting inside. Four brand new fairy tales, one copy of each. Mr. DeVille would hang a sign on his door, closed until final notice, and then he'd huddle in his back room day after day, diligently copying the new tales by hand until he had enough books for every child in Gabaldon. As for the mysterious originals, they appear one morning in his shop window, a sign that Mr. Duval had finished his exhausting task at last. He'd open his doors to a three-mile line that snaked through the square down the hill slopes and around the lake, jammed with children thirsting for new stories and, pre and parents desperate to see if any of the missing had made it into this year's tales. Needless to say, the Council of Elders had plenty of questions for Mr. Duval. When, a when asked who sent the books, Mr. Duval said he hadn't the faintest idea. When asked how long the books had been appearing, Mr. Duval said he couldn't remember a time when books did not appear. When he questioned, when asked whether he ever questioned, this ma magical appearance of books, Mr. Duval replied, where else would storybooks come from? Then the elders noticed something else about Mr. Duval's storybooks. All the villages in them looked just like Gabadon. The same lakeshore cottage and colorful eaves, the same purple and green tulips that lined along the dirt, the thin, along the thin dirt roads, the same crimson carriages, wood front shops, yellow schoolhouse, the leaning clock tower, only drawn as fantasy in a far away in a far, far away land. These storybook villages existed only for one purpose to begin a fairy tale and to end it. Everything in between the beginning and the end happened in the dark, endless woods that surrounded the town, and that's when they noticed that Gabaldon, too, was surrounded by dark, endless woods. Back when the children first started to disappear, villagers stormed the fo forest to find them, only to be repelled by storms, floods, cyclones, and falling trees. When they finally braved their way through, they found a town hiding beyond the trees and eventually besieged it only to discover it was their own. Indeed, no matter where the villagers entered the woods, they came out right where they started. The woods, it seemed, had no intention of returning their children. And one day they found out why. Mr. Duval had finished unpacking that year's storybooks when he noticed a large smudge hiding in the box's fold. He touched his finger to it and discovered the smudge was wet ink. Looking closer, he saw it was a seal with an elaborate crest of a black swan and a white swan. On the crest were three letters, S, G, E. There was no need for him to guess what these letters meant. It was on the banner beneath the crest, and small black words that told the village where their children had gone, the school for good and evil. The kidnappings continued. But now the thief had a name. They called him the schoolmaster. <sniffs> a few minutes after ten, Sophie pried the last lock off the window and cracked open the shutters. She could see to the, e to the forest edge where her father, Stefan, stood with the rest of the perimeter guard. But instead of looking anxious like the others, he was smiling. Hand on widow, widow Honro's shoulder. Sophie grimaced. What her father saw in that woman, she had no idea. Once upon a time, her mother had been as flawless as a storybook queen. Honro, meanwhile, had a small head, round body, and looked like a turkey. Her father whispered mischievously into the widow's ears, and Sophie's cheeks burned. If it were Honro's two little sons that might be taken... He'd be serious as death. True, Stefan had locked her in at sundown and given her a kiss, dutifully acted the loving father, but Sophie knew the truth. 
She had seen it in his face every day of her life. Her father didn't love her. Because she wasn't a boy. Because she didn't remind him of, her, of himself. Now he wanted to marry that beast. Five years after her mother's death, it wouldn't be seen as improper or callous. A simple exchange of vows and he'd have two sons, a new family, a fresh start. But he needed his, his daughter's blessing for the fir first for the elders to allow it. The few, a few times he'd tried, Sophie had changed the subject or loudly chopped cucumbers or smiled the way she did at Radley. Her father hadn't mentioned Honra again. Let her, let the coward marry her when I am gone. She thought, glaring at him through the shutters. Only when she was gone would he appreciate her. Only when she was gone would he know. Would he know no one could replace her? And only when he was gone would he see he had spawned so much more than a son. He had born a princess. On her windowsill, Sophie had laid out gingerbread hearts for the schoolmaster with, delica with delicate care. <laughs> for the first time in her life, she'd made them with sugar and butter. These were special, after all. A message to say she'd come willingly. Sinking into her pillow, she closed her eyes on the windows, father, her father's and wretched gabaldon, and with a smile counted the seconds and counted the seconds to midnight. As soon as Sophie's head had vanished beneath the window, Agatha shoved the gingerbread hearts in her mouth. Only thing these will invite are rats, she thought, crumbs dribbling on her black clump shoes. She yawned and set on her way as the town clock inch past the quarter hour. Upon leaving Sophie after their walk, Agatha had started home, only to have visions of Sophie darting into the woods to find the school for fools and crackpots and ended up gored by a boar. So she had returned to Sophie's garden and waited behind a tree, listening as Sophie undid her window, singing a bird braid song about princes, packed her bags, now singing about wedding bells, put now singing about wedding bells, put on makeup and her finest dress. Every everybody loves a princess in pink, and finally, finally, tucked herself into bed. Agatha mashed the last of the crumbs with her clump, and trudged towards the cemetery. Sophie was safe and would wake up tomorrow feeling like a fool. Agatha wouldn't rub it in. Sophie would need her more would need her more than ever now, and she would be there for her. Here in this safe, secluded world of the two of them would make their own paradise. As Agatha tramped up the slope she noticed an arc of darkness in the forest's in the forest's torch lit border. Apparently, the guards responsible for the cemetery had decided what lived inside it wasn't worth protecting. <laughs> for as long as Agatha could remember, she had a talent for making people go away. Kids fled from her like, va like a vampire bat. Adults clung to the walls as she passed, afraid she might curse them. Even the gravekeepers on the hill bolted at the sight of her. With each new year... Whispers in town grew, grew louder. Witch, villain, evil school. Until she looked for excuses not to go out. First days, then weeks, until she haunted her grave, graveyard house like a ghost. There were still plenty of ways to entertain herself at first. She wrote poems, It's a Miserable Life, and Heaven is a Cemetery were her best drew portraits of the reaper that frightened the mice more than the real cat did, and even tried her hand at a book of fairy tales, grimly ever after, about beautiful children who died horrible deaths. But she had no one to show these things to until the day Sophie knocked. Reaper licked her ankles as she stepped 
onto her squeaking porch. She heard singing inside. In the forest. I'm not going to try and sing this. In the forest primeval, a, good for, a school for good and evil. Agatha rolled her eyes as she pushed open the door. Her, mother's, her mother, back turned, sang cheerily as she packed the trunk with black capes, broomsticks, and pointy black witches hats. Two towers like twin heads, one for the pure, one for the wicked. Try to escape, you'll always fail. The only way out is through a fairy tale. Planning an exotic vacation, Agatha said. Last time I checked, there's no way out of Gabaldon, unless you grow wings. Callus turned. Do you think three capes is enough? She asked. Bug eyes, bulging hair, a greasy black helmet. Agatha winced at just how, mu just how much they looked alike. They're exactly the same, she muttered. Why do you need three? In case you need to lend one to a friend, dear. These are for me? I put two hats in case one gets squashed and a broomstick in case they're smelled, and a few vials of dog's tongue, lizard legs, and frog's toes. Who, know, who knows how long theirs have been sitting there? Agatha knew the answer, but asked anyway, Mother, what do I need with, what do I need capes, hats, and frog's toes for? For the new witch welcoming, of course, Callus trilled. <coughs> You don't want to get to the new school for evil and look like an amateur. <laughs> Agatha kicked off her clump. Let's put aside the fact that the town doctor believes all this. Why is it so hard to accept that I'm happy here? I have everything I need. My bed, my cat, my friend. Well, you should learn from your friend, dear. She wants something from life, Callis said, latching the trunk. Really, Agatha, what could be greater than a f what could be gr a greater destiny than a fairy tale witch? I dreamed of going to the school for evil. Instead, the schoolmaster took that idiot Sven, who ended up outwitted by a princess, the useless ogre, and set on fire. I'm not surprised that boy could barely lace his own boots. I'm not. Sh I'm sure if the schoolmaster could have done it over, he'd he'd have taken me. <laughs> Agatha slid under her covers. Well, everyone in this town still thinks you're a witch, so you got your wish after all. My wish, Callus whipped around. Callus whipped around. My wish is that you get away from here. She hissed, eyes dark as coal. This place has made you weak and lazy and afraid. At least I made something of myself here. You just waste and rot until Sophie comes to walk you like a dog. Agatha stared at her son. Callus smiled brightly and resumed packing. But do take care of your friend, dear. The school for good might seem like a festoon, ro like a festoon of roses, but she's in for a surprise. Now go to bed. The schoolmaster will be here soon, and it's easier for him if you're asleep. Agatha pulled the sheets over her head. Sophie couldn't sleep. Five minutes to midnight, and no sign of and no sign of an intruder. She knelt on her bed and peered through the shutters around Gabaldon's edge. The thousand-person guard waved torches. To light up the forest, Sophie scowled. How could he get past them? And that's when she noticed the hearts on her window were gone. He's here already. Three packed pink bags plopped through the window, followed by two glass slippered feet. Agatha lurched in bed and jolted from a nightmare. Callus snored loudly from across the room, Reaper at her side. Next to Agatha's bed sat her locked trunk. Agatha of Gabaldon, 1 Graves Hill Road, in scraggy writing, along with a pouch of honey cakes for the journey. Chomping cake, Agatha 
glaze, gaze through the cracked window down the hill. The torches blazed in a tight circle. <laughs> but here on Graves Hill, there was just one burly guard left. But as big as Agatha's whole body, legs like chicken drumsticks, he kept himself awake by lifting a broken headstone like a barbell. Agatha bit into the last honey cake and looked out into the 